a very interesting uh, uh, session. We invite the panels, Miguel Ignacio Eta, Strategic Relations Manager of the CNIC, Ariel Grazer, CEO in Rockstar, Lia Solis, Professional Court in Tel Bolivia, Douglas Fisher, and Peering Forum uh, Network Engineering. The panel will be chaired by Sebastian Schoenfeld, Senior Communications uh, ad Advisor in ISOC. Welcome. And instead of Ignacio Estrada, unfortunately, we'll have Carlos Martinez, Lacnec. My apologies. The region is like this. So thank you. Come ahead. A, a round of applause. So let's encourage them to come here. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you uh, for your presentation. Well, I'm Sebastian Schoenfeld, and as my sweater indicates, I'm, I belong to the Internet. I work for the Internet Society. And just to repeat what Tomas already said, with me today we have Carlos Martinez, engineer, CTO of LACNIC, Ariel Geiser, CEO of Rockstar and President of Cavase. You're an engineer, right? Pia Solis, General Manager of LACNOC and Corp Professional Ventel Bolivia. You're an engineer too, right? And Douglas Fisher, Control and Automation Engineer. So it's four engineers and me. So we're going to do the best we can. What are we going to talk about of a problem that we face in uh, the universe of Internet quite often uh, across the region? We can assume that it happens in many countries in the world and this poses many problems. And they are difficult to solve. These are blocks ordered by justice to sites and services for the Internet Society. This is a matter of concern. We understand that this is one of the ways the Internet gets affected by external decisions, very often not understanding the nature of uh, the network and the tend to fragment the network, and we have to avoid. Having said that, they, uh, there are cra uh, clashing interests, there are rights that are legitimate, for instance, the rights of the owners of the intellectual property, property right owners of uh, contents that are uh, hijacked and that are illegally uh, streamed and there but uh, the uh, law the ju the judge orders to block the entire ip and but while the problem would require a dialogue a multilateral view or uh, the the way uh, the internet should solve the problem, the internet way of solving this problem. That's what we would call it, to try to find a phrase. So I'm going to suggest starting with a look. Here we have a range of perspectives. Each of them uh, will tell us how you see uh, these problems uh, um, 
will ha having to handle with these uh, decisions of court. The idea is that we can analyze um, the problem as broadly as possible so that we can see a way of looking for alternatives to solve this. So let me now give the floor to Leah Solis. So uh, she, in five minutes, not more than that, please tell us uh, the uh, um, how you, do you see this? So the blockades initially come with an order. We understand that they correspond to a real problem. So the actors, um, are, uh, through the legal procedures, make uh, there's an order that comes for the blockade. So this, um, the, the problem comes for the technical people. So, and once the technical sector receives uh, the order, they analyze how to make the block it more, to block it more directly. They can block the IPs or domain. And what's happening recently, it's that they block her app. So, so you will need a more holistic analysis. So we analyze to what extent you can uh, uh, see the scope. Now, what are the challenges? Where are we going to apply this blockade? We are talking about a resilient network when we have the content in several sites. So we can't block all the sites. We have equipment. We try to, well, the, the client is resilient to and may configure another IP. We have the blocks in the board in equipment that is not designed for this purpose. And finally, there may be a solution that has additional costs that are blocking in the cloud. So there we have greater uh, challenges and uh, higher costs, oper operational costs, commercial costs, etc. So, what uh, do we are uh, are we going to do? Is well, we in the end, if we are requested to block uh, an app, what can we do? We can even have collateral damage that we were not worried as blocking other contents or also we have the blocks the blockades that will stay in uh, the devices configured and it also has implications in the operational cost of maintenance what happens if we have a list of exceptions and in that list doing a maintenance uh, or an update that turns into something more complex the ideal thing is to be as minimalistic as you can, uh, uh, targeting flexibility. So these are some of the challenges that we see, but always for compliance, uh, considering the requirements. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Douglas, would you like to tell us of your experience with uh, blockades? Could you give us your view? Yes, indeed. Well, I can start by telling you that there are two points of view here. One is that of the operator with a more operational, and it's more operational service, that says we want to receive the exact instructions of we need to do. And that is not exactly what we receive. We receive something that we have to judge whether it's correct or not, how to do it. If we, uh, what will the, be the impact of doing this or that? But whatever you do, all the communication of this, they can say, well, I block all this IP. So the so you may have a, a CDN with millions of uh, IPs. You can't do that. The uh, court orders. Uh, are totally, well, not totally, but mostly they don't have any technical rationale. And that's what we said initially when 
where you have a court demand for a, an error in the calculations of a building that uh, falls down and they they call an expert to do the estimates if it's a calculation if it's a if you can do the accounting then the justice will call an expert for that but that doesn't happen in the internet they do it for engineering but not for here because we don't when we receive court orders they have absolutely no technical judgment and we need to do what they say so if we see it from the point of view of the operators we have to uh, obey and abide by that now the other thing is what we do as people the ideal thing would be to automate everything and to do it more integrated but as we do something absolutely automated and integrated we would have a very dangerous machine to create a blockade that can be used for the good things or for the bad things so that's the second point of view that is quite worrisome and also before we go to uh our, before we ask the other participants of the panel do you have any concrete experience to tell us well we had in brazil here for instance we had cases where we received a court order a decision by court of the justice representative uh, to block a specific website in a site and not just to block but to re to uh, redirect the attempts of that website to a specific site of a police station for instance the people that issued that order doesn't know what they are requesting because in order to do that we need to commit a crime that is entering in the contents that's not what an ISP does so people that use the ISPs and the, the, we, we have the ISP and uh, the contents providers the ISPs they say it was in the internet but there's no such thing as the internet nothing lasts more than 300 milliseconds it enters here and then it leaves that's as long as it lasts so uh it goes through the internet but it's not in the internet but we receive orders and we need to do that and when you say that you can't do it you are in conflict with a representative of justice and that's a very serious problem Leah well I have two cases one happened seven or eight years ago it uh, vulnerated uh, the privacy of a person at the time we had a request for blocking that page but we didn't have the contents so we try to abide strictly by the law and we blocked it as such and at the time we blocked that content that website but from but that's very different to justify we can't guarantee that the client will do that the client will become more expert they use vpns they change the dns etc and now recently we had cases of a blockage for contents that are not paying it's content that is a, a provider is paying for broadcasting but it's being transmitted by another contents provider without charging in that case blockades go with an order but there is a peculiarity that they don't ask the dynamic blockade what does that imply that we have to play cat and mouse uh, imagine a list uh, of blockades that may vary all the time i don't think that should be done by the operators as a matter of fact it may not be even attacking the operator it's there because it it's come for everybody thank you
Now we are going to request Ariel Kreiser to give us his view. Well, the, the chair never lets the microphone go. Please tell us how you see it from the different angles that you know. Yes, I don't want to repeat the same look because it's already been established. I'd like to see things from another perspective to so as to give you a different angle. When we look, at, when we are speaking of blocking illegal sites, we are speaking of privacy in most cases. And what we are typically discussing uh, is that it's affecting business. And it's very clear that the owners of the intellectual property rights defend their property, their business, trying to find potential paths to put a, to, uh, to stop the situation. And they, they are free to do that because they own a property that uh, uh, is coming to be stolen. On the other hand, we have the lack of knowledge of the uh, legal structures and normally they give orders that very often cannot be uh, met to achieve that. And finally, we have our, uh, the, our users. Um, every time that we have one of these events that where we have privacy, for instance, uh, every time that we have Boca River, the traffic of the internet has huge uh, uh, traffic. And as an operator, it's very difficult to cover that with your hands because the pirate traffic comes from many different uh, sites. We are speaking of business. We are speaking of distribution models. Very often we see that the distribution, the pirate, pirate uh, comes from the same side as the official uh, broadcasting. And how, how do you do that? How come the same who is distributing the official contents uh, also produce the uh, piracy? So, and that's where we would receive the traffic. So, are we speaking of economic models? Um, it's not just a technical solution that we need. I think that the solution is also approached from the business model. So, today, um, many, 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 many years ago, if you wanted to call, to make a telephone call from the United States, to, from Buenos Aires to uh, the United States, it cost uh, $30. Uh, and I, there were many technical models I, I, using Protocol 25, and I helped that to reduce the cost of those calls. Do you know when everything was over? When the cost of the minute when they they would call, uh, charge you a sensible fee. The problem in football, for instance, is the money Messi makes, because that is what makes football, soccer so expensive. That's why I'm speaking of the business model, because technically either you can't meet it or you won't find the way to solve. There is we need to understand the real problem. The owner of rights have the rights to defend their property. The problem is the entire chain from who they hire for distribution, how this is distributed, because it's not the same for a nine-year-old child to use the social media and uh, are showing uh, the television and sending, uh, streaming it than if it's coming through another way. 
I'm not worried about the child um, uh, showing the television from home, but I'm worried about a distribution network showing 4K contents if it's not the legal pathway. So I think that the implications of all this is that. I'm the president of CABASE, the Internet Association of Argentina, and CABASE is uh, against uh, 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 piracy in Latin America because we understand that one of the problems that we have to solve from different angles, not just from the angle of a technical blockade. Thank you, Ariel. Well, we see that we have multiple factors, legitimate uh, rights, users, operators, distribution links that do uh, have dual roles. They transmit uh, they uh, legally and illegally the same contents. And so um, uh, creating business uh, model problems. So, and here you may all debate. I I'm, may make technical mistakes, but the same peak, well, the, there's, it's not the same if there's a surge of consumption from a private uh, sector, whether that alters the use of the internet for all the rest. The, and uh, just the same, a poor judgment of court may damage third parties. It may be blocking other systems, other services, Carlos, from the technical community. What ramifications do you have in a poor judgment by a court? Does that have an impact? If a judge in Brazil orders blocking a service in other countries, is it possible since the network respects no borders of the nation states? May we are stumbling intervening in uh, territories where you have no jurisdiction. And finally, what is the effect of the network as a whole when somebody blocks something and does it badly? Well, let me give you another angle. Um, I used to be an operator. I never distributed content, but now I have to see the internet um, at a different, in a different way. First of all, I'd like to start by saying that I must admit that there is a conflict. And it's natural for the parties to feel a vulnerable. Um, vulnerated. Now, having said that, we need to go through the consequences of the wrong defense. Because using the wrong instrument to defend I intellectual property rights may be harmful. What is the impact that you can have? Well, you know that the legal schemes of the nation states and the concepts of borders have not uh, been uh, understood well. The internet is an interconnected network and they don't know the borders and the borders are the peer BGP. So if you go there, you'll see that uh, there are administrative borders. So considering um, considering that the internet is a, a group of uh, subconnected networks, we have to be very careful about what you do. Brazil, both because of ge geographic uh, um, makeup and the size of its economy, has become a bridge of interconnection of many countries in the region. So in a way, uh, it's what happened for the Americas in, in Miami, that is. What uh, the home of the Americas used to play uh, in Miami, now it's played by Brazil. And that br uh, brings a lot of responsibility. There have been cases 
where um, there have been orders to block poorly implemented, for instance, the blocking of WhatsApp in a uh, state in Brazil left all Paraguay with no WhatsApp. So that's the sort of thing that, in my view, are very, very harmful for what we consider a tool for development. So there are many cases. And uh, one of the things since I entered LACNIC is what happened in 2008 in Pakistan. In the, in the Pakistan court ordered to block YouTube, and we all know what happened. We can't tell it again. Fifteen years later, we continue to talk of that. It was a bit extreme, but that sort of things we have to be very careful. Of course, it's not just one, uh, the responsibility of one, the carrier decided to accept it. We might find some sort of mitigation of shared responsibility. But the internet is an interconnected network, and we have to be very careful about what we do in the network, thinking of the huge collateral damage that you can do. In the case of Uruguay, I know that at a the time they requested to block an IP. Fortunately, somebody checked it, and it was one of the IPs of Cloudflare. Can you imagine if we blocked it? It would have there would have been people protesting on the streets. So blocking is a tool. I'm not aware of what ha can happen as a tool. Uh, we need some safeguards. So, as Leah said, the. Uh, if you block something that has a limited uh, uh, time, what is the effect uh, blocking IPs? We have the IPv4 space. It's like uh, a Swiss cheese full of holes. And the interesting thing about it is that there are very few databases that you can consult to say what IPs are blocked. So when you can't access an IP, you don't know whether the submarine cable is out of order or it was uh, cut or whether it's blocked for some reason. So that creates operators huge problems because the customers claim that it doesn't work, but uh, you don't know why. So this might, uh, the uh, blocking an IP may be a, a needed tool, but I invite you to read positioning on uh, uh, blockades at LACNIC that give more details. As a summary, don't block anything, but if you're going to block something, at least do it uh, carefully. Well, thank you, Carlos. Now we're going to have a dual participation of uh, the audience. On the one hand, we want to request those with an anecdote, a specific story of a blockade. Uh, if you are operators, network operators, please take the microphone. In the meantime, we're, we're going to show you the results of a survey. Oh, the presentation is no longer there now that we needed it precisely. We conducted a survey in the LACNOC list. I wanted to, to show quickly the results to show you the context, the participations of the year audience. Can we recover the PowerPoint that was here? Okay. Uh, let's while uh, we get the presentation back, let's listen to the anecdotes by uh, the public of operators. I'm Rolando Rojas, and I wanted. I'm an operator, but of a university network in Costa Rica, the uh, state-owned distance uh, university. Last year in Costa Rica, we had quite an important cyber attack to the government, and we had to block a lot. And personally, we had to send to block external websites and countries. 
But there were also students uh, abroad that we blocked. So there, there was a bit, uh, a small chaos. Another anecdote is that administration uh, of the university, they, uh, you have, it tells you that you have to block porn, pornography, but there's a department that needs to see some parameters of pornography to conduct studies and tests and all that. So you're blocking and applying a filter so that some people may see it and others may not. And then you have another thing with the issue of the universities blocking some websites, Facebook, WhatsApp, because at home the internet, I pay it well and it's free for me. But in, at a university, and if a university is public, then it turns into a public asset. I have to see to see to the good use of the internet at that university because it's a public asset, and I can't uh, damage it. So if the people inside are using Instagram or Facebook, I I can give full internet to the things that use uh, need full internet, so as email, uh, research uh, websites. But when the people see that Facebook is slow and Instagram is slow, then they say that the internet is no good. It is good, but I'm seeing to a good usage of the public asset. Uh, so that's our experience. Thank you. Hello. I don't know whether I can request any any members of the panel. We'd like you to. Uh, we are going to have a Q and A uh, later. It's just a comment to see whether you can answer later, and it's as follows. Uh, both uh, Fisher and Leah mentioned, and I see that uh, this happens is when they request, uh, when the operators and uh, access providers receive orders for blocking. Bec and that makes no sense because we are telecom operators, broadband, and there is a limit to what we can really block. If we receive a request for blocking an IP uh, uh, address, it, you can do it, but sometimes we receive requests to block a URL, and that is absolutely out of the scope of an internet provider, so I have a doubt. Should I ignore it? Should I do it? Shouldn't I? I see that there are people that are trying to invent proxy services to uh, a director, the proxy, and that creates a great uh, uh, um, effort, and uh, and it costs. So that request uh, for blocking needs to be sent to the people that can do it, removing contents of air, for instance, but not to send requests that make no sense, that can't even be done, and that will harm a company, for instance, uh, a blockade that's not very effective. And the issue, and uh, people think it's it makes sense, just ignore it, don't do anything, and then uh, to accept the consequences. We need to strike a balance between the two things. What do you think? Any comments? So, let's see. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Ariel, and I come from, uh, well, doesn't matter where from. Can I mention trademarks or names? Ariel of the Death Star, you are responsible for your own words. 
I'm quite new here, however, I constantly receive crazy requests. I don't know. I think I could write a book about that. Let me start with something that Charlie said. Charlie said, if you're going to filter, and then he didn't complete the phrase. It's happened that there are some things that can be filtered, that in a way there are possibilities to be filtered. They, they can be filtered. For instance, uh, the um, piracy can be filtered. However, once what happened was that there was something that looked very easy to filter, but by mistake, I think, uh, we can see that technically that it had the IP of one of the DNSs of a car. So if you didn't check, uh, you looked at the IPs that and you put it in a zero in the router, you could filter a very important DNS in our country. And something that seemed stupid, I don't know whether uh, intentionally or unintentionally of the host did. I think that it was unintentional, and but uh, uh, the there was a disaster when filtering it. So you have to be careful because sometimes things look very easy, but then afterwards they end up uh, in a much larger disaster, and they are things that are very difficult to check. So we may all see how far we can go with the rule of the request, and then there were crazy cases. Our government delivers laptops to people, children at school, but then some people sell the laptops, and I've received the request for filtering a site that's called Mercado Libre because they post ads, or I've been asked to filter Cloudfare or Blogger, so I could tell you of stories all day, and it happens. I could write a book, really, and in Star Death, when you have one of those situations, what do you do? What should you do? For instance, blocking Cloudflare. Well, I would have to ask my lawyer who's there. I'm going to give him the floor. Thank you. Hello, I'm Esteban Lescano. And I speak as the director of the legal department of Cavasse, the Argentine Internet uh, Society. And uh, as Ariel said, we constantly receive requests for blocking uh, sites. Sometimes they are the fashion. We can say, well, they started with uh, the online gaming sites because Argentina, the authorities, uh, game authorities, it depends on each province. So a gaming uh, platform may be allowed in one uh, province and not in another. So one uh, province judge may order to block uh, a platform that's legitimate in other provinces. So when the ISP receives that order, uh, so you may say, well, if I br block uh, that, I can't distinguish. Uh, I, c I don't know where each user is, so I'm blocking for all, and I'm going beyond the jurisdiction of the judge that is usually limited to a certain province. But the case that I wanted to tell you about that was a paradigm was the case of Uber. When in 2015 in Buenos Aires, Uber was banned. So because of a number of uh, court uh, uh, actually, so we received the decision of a court in Buenos Aires asking us to block Uber, block uh, to block the access to Uber. And so you would read the uh, um, the decision, and we, you didn't know what that meant. So we we had to explain them how you do go about blocking is you we had to explain the ip the url the dns so we had to teach the uh, um um uh, judges to explain what they were asking because we have to protect the traffic of internet the way it operates the way many things that were there 
and we didn't want uh, to uh, go against uh, the operation of the internet. So finally, the judge understood uh, what could be uh, re uh, requested, and they blocked uh, a very concrete URL, and it had to do with the access of the platform of Uber. But it was a process that took uh, several months, and it was very important but we we had to do a lot of we had to work a lot with uh, the judiciary let me add a touch of color that you didn't mention i don't know whether we, whether you did it intent, intentionally in the meantime we suffered threats of the taxi union a manifestation of the taxi union making us responsible of the damage that uh, Uber, how Uber damaged us. The, uh, let me uh, speak Portuguese, but I request uh, your apologies. But because we've gone through uh, many different, many, sev several things, uh, similar things, when we receive a court order, um, when we challenge, we look for the. Uh, uh, judicial authority to ask them uh, there something there we we want to tell them that there's something wrong then what would they answer is they threaten us to take us to prison to jail things of of that sort and even worse than that so I can say okay I'm going to uh, remove your rights well as we don't have any concessions? Well, but of course, I'm not speaking of all judges. I'm giving examples of uh, strange cases. There are people who collaborate, who try to do things right, who do things right. But those that do not collaborate cause so much noise, so much difficulties, and su such an emotional stress that it's worth mentioning it. Yes. And then here we have in the slide those that uh, completed this anonymously. Uh, well, sometimes you receive orders that you cannot. Uh, that, uh, have you ever received orders that you could not uh, obey? My name is Carlos. I'm going to speak in the name of Colombia. The issue of Colombia is interesting because we d we divide it into two parts: the legal part and the technical part. The regulations state that we need to block two types of content, child pornography and online gaming, that are not authorized by the government at a national level. But there are many problems that we run into. The first problem is that the list is issued by the national police. It's posted by the ministry in an FTP. And that list has 20,000 registries. 20, 22,000 at present of IP addresses, some of which don't exist. They're very, very old. Others are new, but it's very dynamic. Now, the issue is that is constantly changing. If somebody is working with child pornography, it will be more than one hour doing that. And then this would be much more dynamic than a site that they uh, posted uh, uh, 24, 48 hours after the pro problem, and they won't be caught so easily. Now, there's an even worse problem, and that is that it would be very simple if the URL got an IP of the server, because sending that to a blacklist would be simple, but they send us lists where the domain, there are subdomains, and in addition, we need to block a path in a subdomain of the domain, and after that, to let the client know that uh, they were blocked. Technically speaking, that is very complex, and in the hardware, that generates a considerable burden. When you have just a few clients, you can do it, but when you start increasing the number of clients and, and 
the gamers that have 2,000, 3,000 connections multiply that time uh, 5,000, 8,000 clients, and you realize that your infrastructure has to grow excessively to be able to control that. So they're leaving us the burden to us, those in the queue that is the small ISPs, but that traffic uh, could be blocked in the heart with with uh, those that have the hardware and the legal problem is that if you don't do it you are in trouble as the company owner because you would be an accomplice in crime and that is punished with 15 years of jail if you don't do something about it so after you need to invest a lot of money to do something that could be done more efficiently. Thank you. Thank you, Tomas. And then back again with the panel. I have an anecdote. We have almost every week they ask us for data. They say we, we need all the data that arrived to this IP address from different countries. Once the FBI called me directly, they said an Australian that has been kidnapped with an IP number that we received a, an, a, a mail with a, an IP that you have and we want to know where they are in the United States. And uh, we say, well, this IP is not in the United States. It's in an ex country. And the FBI say, OK, and they hang. So how far does jurisdiction go because you may have an IP number and then what they just said with the province of Buenos Aires in some places uh, it's allowed in others you can't and uh, for instance with gaming sometimes it's impossible to block it because it's in a different country because somebody else is using it this is what I wanted to tell you yes thank you Tomas after the comments of the colleagues um, something that we we talk a lot of how the court uh, uh, suits are not adequate, but I, I have to make a comment for our network operators. There are things that we have to do and that are not done that make it much easier to comply with law. For instance, does your network that have an internal recursive DNS? Because if they do, part of the problem, it's much more simple to apply things. The things that, that the first question is the easiest. The second is, do you have different VRF tables for different clients? For instance, do you have a VRATS with uh, 500 uh, clients or 10,000 clients are of province A and 15,000 are of province B and you receive an order of province A to block? Uh, the, if you didn't implement VRF to segregate the types of clients, you can't uh, do that and you can't c comply with no. So I'm calling the, your attention so that you do things properly because after you have 60,000 clients, if you want to retrofit that into implementation, it's not easy. Okay, thank you. We have 10 minutes left. And as we were listening to people's comments, we hear many factors that have an impact here. There might be some solutions so if we were the ones that could decide how to deal with this problem in an ideal world, what path or what things, Douglas just said it, uh, he said there are things that can be done that you can foresee to uh, meet with some of these requirements. But if we were to think of an ideal situation, we had to respect everybody's rights or to try to respect the rights of clients and the third parties that owe the right of those that uh, uh, claim for something, let's assume that it's legitimate. How do we go about it? 
what would be a way or what are the things that we should consider to find an ideal way of dealing with this problem? I think this would be quite an ambitious solution, but maybe we are considering to be as close as possible to the end customer. If we look, go through the different layers and we come closer to where this content is being originated, then we could be working hand in hand. If we're going to send our own content and we don't want this to be plagiated or encrypted, this will depend on the context of the problem. I couldn't suggest a specific solution, just to work as close as possible to where the content is being generated. If I compare this to a water supply, if you realize we're working in the layer where the water is distributed to the homes, and we're trying to cover those spaces. But we're not going to the place where water is concentrated, so that we could apply certain policies in order to work, and so that then this is distributed in a clean way. I think, for example, of the case of the soccer matches when you are streaming, sending an encrypted channel costs money, but maybe in the long run, this will have the benefit of not ruining the signal. So, I won't go into the technical issues because we have colleagues who are familiar with that, although in a past life I was an engineer. Now, let me add another point of view to add on. There are some countries, and in Argentina we tried to invent this but weren't able to do so, but we'll try to do so, and hopefully we'll be able to manage to do so, to have a law that speaks about the non responsibility or non-liability of the technological intermediaries, because if you go to prison for not complying with a law that is impossible to comply with, this might weaken us and place us in a position that is very weak, we're very exposed. So this is also fighting like the internet community and as operator to have laws that protect us. But if this is for a third party's offense. And along the chain, we are sometimes easier to find, and that is why we end up being in the middle. So we try to see how we can strengthen the legal framework so they don't go against us. We can assist in finding solutions to the problems with different technical structures, but we also have to have uh, legal backing so as we are not sent to prison for not being able to comply with a law that is impossible to comply with. I wanted to refer to the technical aspects, but I think it is important to build spaces for conversation and dialogue regarding the legal framework and law enforcement so that these orders for blocking that are sometimes sort of crazy, at least so that these are specified technically and in a consistent way and that they are realistic, like Douglas was saying. So it has to be clear as to what they wish to achieve through this. And I had something to share with you, but I think we're running out of time. So ultimately, well, Carlos, we do like those stories, those anecdotes. Well, many, many years ago, some time, I went as an expert to uh, lawsuit where pornographic material was being exchanged between different parties. And this was written in such a way that first it seemed as if it had been extracted from a classical book. It was very flourished language. It referred to IPs that didn't even exist. There was an IP that was 200.874 and things such as that. And well, beyond the joke, it showed that probably the poor judge who tried to do something about this was clearly overwhelmed by the reality. Now, many years later, that gap became solved. So the orders that we started to receive were far well written and were more specific. Now, when did this break again? When we ran out of 
IPv4 and carrier grade NAT appeared. So we have seen things like, for example, I need to have information related to the originator of this email who came from IP 10, 24, 38, something. Now, the question is, well, am I also need, going to need the port of origin? Well, then we lose this completely. So these are a couple of anecdotes that show that we have to have a far stronger dialogue with this community in order to help them to see if they can comply with the function that, as a society, we have assigned to them. Now, that is the responsibility that we have as a technical community, namely to try to build that knowledge and also to help the law enforcement. Douglas, this is a comment that I'd like to make. There are technical things that you can do. I made a presentation in the past regarding blocking legal sites and how to do deployment. But one of the things that caught my attention today, we're here at a network operators meeting and we had difficulties in finding people from the, from the justice to bring them here. Some weeks ago, I participated in a internet governance activity and I was like a loner on the technical side of the, and what I was saying was like Greek to them. So what we have to do is to bring the two worlds closer to one another. So we have thousands of technical solutions, but we really have to bring the two worlds together, the legal group and the technical group. So this is something that we really have to try to achieve. Let me tell you a story, Douglas, that has to do with this. Many years ago in Argentina, express um, hijacking was in fashion, so someone was hijacked for a couple of hours. Someone was kidnapped, and this was just for a couple of hours. Two things happened at the same time. The president of the country issued a decree one night stating that all internet providers had to provide access to the security and spionage agency in Argentina and to give them the email addresses of all our customers. Just to tell you this short story, uh, long story short, we went against the justice and the president five years later. We won through an order of the Supreme Court of Justice. We beat the state. They couldn't ask us for that information. We couldn't provide that information. But at the same time, we worked with the attorney general who was quite concerned about child kidnapping. Together with that attorney, we developed a working protocol in order to be able to rapidly deliver the IP from which this claim was being made, as well as the address. And this was just not any information. This was not someone from a law enforcement organization we worked side by side with justice, and we implemented a procedure whereby we could find a solution to this problem of child uh, or child's kidnapping within a couple of minutes. So what Douglas was saying happened to us, and this happens all the time. So we have to work side by side with justice to explain this to them so that they can understand this and to find solutions to real problems and not just change sides of the, on the street. We have to have the legal instruments and we have to have the necessary legal conversation to make this possible. Technically, for sure, we'll be able to find a solution to this. So we have run out of time. We are beyond the time. Mr. Lynch here is checking the time we're past. Okay, so it is quite clear that this is an issue that has to be dealt with. We have to continue discussing these issues. We have to, there has to be a will and the good disposition, both from the different agencies of the government, the legal area, and 
law enforcement. So it's important to discuss these things and figure out ways to achieve those goals. Thank you very much to the members of the panel. A big round of applause for them. And to all of you as well for being with us and for participating. Thank you.